Did you know that Bay Pio is the on campus restaurant? هل كنت تعرف أن عاصمة أوزبكستان هي تشقا للجامعة؟ أوه هذا Welcome to Carnegie Mellon University in Cover. Feel free to talk with me in English or Arabic. What's your native language? How can I help you? English is an important language. I am a roboceptionist. What do you do? I'm a bilingual roboceptionist. I should be able to answer Carnegie Mellon related questions in Arabic and in English. Try me. To get to 1004, you need to take the entrance to your left, then turn left again, walk straight and take the second corridor to your right. It should be one of the offices inside. Thank you. You're welcome. How old are you? A robo lady never reveals her true age. Let's just say I'm not the newest model on the block. Have a good day. And remember, the next time your computer doesn't work, don't hit it. We have feelings too. Dr. Reed Simons, thank you so much for taking the time for this interview. And first we'd like to know from you, how can we call a robot socially interactive and how is it different from any other robot? So, most robots, when they operate, they only take them, themselves into account. Their own safety, um, their achievement of their own goals, so how fast to get to a particular location, how easily it takes to do something. But in social interactions, you take other people into account as well. So you have to understand what they're trying to do and what you can do to help both of you um, do something smoothly. Mm -hmm. So like when you're getting onto an elevator, if you barge into the elevator, when people are trying to get out, you block the elevator and no one can move. Mm -hmm. So the people who are getting on wait till the people get off and then they can get on. And by doing so, by understanding that there is a someone else who is trying to, to achieve a goal to try and do something, then you can get uh, both people um, acting very smoothly and they won't interfere with each other. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the basis of social interaction. And socially interactive robots are robots that not only take their own um, goals into account, mm -hmm. but also the goals of people around them. Mm -hmm. So how does a social interactive robot really work? So basically the main difference is that what I said, that they have to understand what the people around them are trying to do and, and, and act accordingly. Um, so one of the things I like to say is that most of us think that uh, the rule, the social rule for getting on and off eleva on, onto elevators is that you wait for everyone to get off the elevator before you get on. Mm -hmm. But that's actually not the correct rule. The correct rule is that you wait for everyone who intends to get off the elevator before you get on. Because some of the people aren't going to get off. They're just waiting to go to another floor. Mm -hmm. And so when we as people, and the elevator opens, when we as people decide whether we want to get on immediately or wait, mm -hmm. we have to look at the people in the elevator and try and understand their intention. Try and understand whether they want to get off or whether they want to stay. Mm -hmm. and that understanding of the other people's intention is what is uh, critical for making socially interactive robots work. Mm -hmm. They have to not only know what they want to do themselves, but they have to perceive the people around them and try and understand what those people are trying to do. 
and people don't have signs on them that says, I'm getting off on floor three, I'm getting off on floor four, um, the robots have to look and, and, and try and understand cues, such as gaze. So when the elevator opens, people who aren't getting off tend to look down. People who are getting off tend to look up, want to make sure it's the right floor. Um, some of them, you know, they start moving. You have to detect the, them moving forward versus just rocking back and forth. And those types of simple cues are things that is, are very difficult for robots to do. So we pick up those cues very, very quickly um, because we've been trained from, you know, from birth to pick up these social cues. But uh, robots have to be programmed to understand those cues and it turns out to be a very difficult thing for them to understand what those cues are. Mm -hmm. So what techniques is CMU doing to enable robots to act in a socially acceptable way? So we're looking at basically two different types of uh, social interaction. One is what I call conversational interaction, which is basically what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. So while I'm talking to you, you're looking at me mm -hmm. and you're nodding at me to, to indicate that you understand what I'm talking about. And uh, if you were to start looking off over to the side there, I would know that um, I had lost you and I need to say something in order to get you back into the conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's kind of conversational interaction, and uh, HALA is an example of a conversationally social interactive robot. Mm -hmm. um, so it uses gaze to try and um, bring people in to engage them. Um, it uh, you know watches them as they as they type on the keyboard, and um, it has it knows enough about um, how conversations run to respond appropriately. Mm -hmm. Someone says hello, the robot will say hello. If someone says salam, the robot will say salam. Um, and uh, you know, so it, 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 it does the appropriate thing in the, in the, right, in the right context. Um, the other aspect that we're looking at is what I call navigational um, interaction. And that is how robots can navigate through space in a socially interactive way. So the getting on and off elevators in a socially interactive way, uh, passing in corridors, so when people are coming towards each other in a corridor, one person moves to the right, the other person moves to the right, and they pass without really having to think very hard about mm -hmm. how to do that. And that's a social rule. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, it's not only a social rule, it's a cultural rule. So in places like England and Japan, where they uh, drive on the left-hand side, um, they don't pass on the right, they pass on the left. Mm -hmm. And so if you were to go to England and um, not understand that, then you would start bumping into people. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to know what the social rule is in order to um, uh, work well in the society. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how do you see the international efforts in the area of social interactive robots and how do you, where do you see the Qatar fits in? So when we started this work, we were focused on social interaction. Mm -hmm. And um, the idea was that there were these kind of universal social rules that people obeyed. And it turns out that that was simplistic, that um, it actually is not only social rules, but cultural rules as well. Mm -hmm. So the way that uh, people interact in um, different parts of the world differ somewhat according to the culture. So um, a, a Middle Eastern culture uh, has somewhat different social rules than a, than a Western culture. Mm -hmm. And so what we're looking at in, in, um, in Qatar, especially with Hala, mm -hmm. is to try and understand those cultural differences and be able to develop a system that can be um, uh, social and culturally appropriate in Qatar mm -hmm. and at the same time if you were to take it to the United States we, it would be socially and culturally appropriate in the United States by changing a few um, a few variables a few parameters mm -hmm. um, right now what we're doing is just trying to explore the various ways that these robots can, can differ um, but one, one, one uh, example in navigational interaction is that um, there is this idea of personal space, how mm -hmm. close people will come to one another when they're talking. 
and in uh, different cultures the personal space is larger or smaller. Mm -hmm. And we can characterize that. We can say, okay, if you're in uh, Mediterranean culture, the personal space is much smaller and we can tell the robot this is mm -hmm. the size of the personal space when you're in Italy, for example, versus the United States where it's much larger. And then the, uh, the robot can, can behave like an Italian or like an American. Mm -hmm. So what do we mean when we speak about the gap between the robotic behavior and the social interaction? What, what do we mean by this gap? So again, the, the, the basic gap is um, understanding other people. Um, it's this idea that the robot is not operating in isolation, but it's operating in a peopled environment and it has to understand not only what it is trying to do, but what the people around it are trying to do. Mm -hmm. And to behave in ways that um, facilitate the, not only its own actions, its own goals, but the goals that it, of, of the other people. Mm -hmm. So um, when, you, uh, when people are, typically, typically when you talk about people being antisocial, you say, oh, he was, he's, he's very rude, he's very antisocial. What they typically mean is that this person only thinks about himself and doesn't think about anyone else. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, the, that's the same thing for the robots. The robots, um, if they behave only thinking about themselves, then they tend to look antisocial. And when they start considering other people, then they, then they look more social. Mm -hmm. So the main thing that we have to look at is how we can get them to understand that there are people around and what those people are interested in doing. Mm -hmm. Whether they want to um, you know, um, have a conversation with the robot, or be left alone, or um, be escorted somewhere, mm -hmm. or um, you know, that they, that they're, they, they have um, you know, certain, certain other needs. Those, all those things need to be understood by the robot in order to be looked at as social. Mm -hmm. So what future uses can socially interactive robots be used in? So my personal philosophy is that social interaction um, can be applied anywhere that we have technology. So not just robots. So you, you, you might think of robo the robot receptionist is a very good example. Uh, service robots. So a robot that is uh, coming in to, let's say, clean floors. Mm -hmm. It needs to know that there are other people around there. Maybe it shouldn't come into this room because there are people working. It goes to some other room first and then comes back to this room later so it doesn't disturb the people. Mm -hmm. Maybe when it comes in, it asks very politely, um, is it okay to clean the room here, rather than just barging in and cleaning the floors? Um, but other technology as well. Um, think about all the things that we use these days that are um, electronic. Um, uh, cell phones, microwaves, uh, DVRs, televisions, stereos. All of those have very... Um, unsocial interfaces. You know, they're, they're buttons and knobs and things like that. They don't understand what people are trying to do. W think about the, uh, a world in which, you know, your microwave knows what, how, how you like your tea to be heated in the morning, the, the, the temperature of the water. And when you come in, you don't have to press all these buttons. It just recognizes you know, here's someone here with a with a teacup. I know that he likes it at you know, um, this particular temperature, mm -hmm. and you just put it in, and it says, "Oh, you know, good morning. Nice to see you again. I'm going to heat your tea up like you normally like you like it." And you can say, "No, I'd like it a little warmer today um, than usual." Okay, I'll do that for you. Mm -hmm. That's social interaction. You know, you can think. That's, that's how you would do it if, uh, you know, two people, a couple living together, you know, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to press buttons, you just talk to them and, and uh, they understand you and they know what you like and, you know, those types of things can be, that type of social interaction can be used anywhere that we have technology. Mm -hmm. It would make interacting with our, our, our technology so much more useful. Mm -hmm.
So when we have a social interactive robot, how can we evaluate it and make sure that, how can we assess its effectiveness? Um, so we're very lucky in, in, in that respect because psychologists have been doing um, experiments on humans, how humans interact for many, many years. And so there's a well understood methodology for um, uh, understanding human-human interaction mm -hmm. and measuring it and measuring its effectiveness. So basically we use the same technologies, the same tech, I'm sorry, we, we basically use the same techniques uh, that the psychologists use in order to um, evaluate and measure. So we do a lot of user studies, we bring people into the lab that, and, and, and ask them to perform certain tasks with the robot and then we uh, look at how well they perform the tasks we ask them to rate their experiences with the robots, and through that we understand which techniques work better, which techniques work worse. Mm -hmm. um, with with Hala, uh, it's a slightly different thing because uh, Hala is out there. We don't invite people in, but uh, when people interact with Hala, um, all the interactions are recorded, and we can do experiments. So um, one week we can run Hala with a certain um, program and the next week we run it with a slightly different program and we can compare how people interact with them, how long they interact, um, whether they um, say thank you to Hala um, when, when she answers their questions, how frequently they, they, they do that, um, how frequently, um, you know, what types of questions they ask and we can use that to try and understand whether changes that we make to Hollow's behavior um, actually improves the interaction or, or, or worsens it. Mm -hmm. And based on that, we can, we can f go further in the research and develop other techniques. Mm -hmm. So my final question, tell us about the lecture you gave about social, and social interactive robots at CMU on April 19th, and how did you find the audience response? Um, <laughs> I think it went rather well. Um, I'm always, it's always hard for me to judge how my own talks go, but uh, there seemed to be a lot of interest in, in this idea of social, social robots. Um, there was, actually what was interesting to me is there was a lot of discussion about why you'd want to have a social robot. Um, so the, one, of the question, one of the things that, that people might ask is, why would you want a, a robot that behaves like a human rather than a robot that behaves like a robot. You know, um, we don't, some people are afraid that if, a, if robots start behaving too much like humans, mm -hmm. that it will um, lessen the difference between robots and humans. Mm -hmm. um, but, so there was a lot of discussion about that. I think though that uh, in general, you do want robots to act more like humans because we know how to interact with other humans. We don't know how to interact with robots right now. Mm -hmm. So if we have a robot that behaves differently than anything we've ever seen before, we have to learn how to interact with it. That takes a lot of effort. So you put a, you put a robot in, let's say, um, uh, an, um, a facility where um, the elderly are mm -hmm. and have the robots you know, try and help the, the elderly get around. Um, older people, they're not going to want to uh, learn how to interact with this very complex mm -hmm. machine. They, they know how to interact with people. They know how to interact with the aides in the, in, the, in the facility. You just want them to, the robots to interact in the same way so people don't have to learn new ways of interacting with this very complex technology. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Reed Simons, for this interview and wish you the best of luck. Thanks Thank a lot. Thanks. It's been a pleasure.